So chapter 10, does anyone remember what happened in chapter 9? Yeah, uh, Lucas, will you grab our door, buddy? It's just a little loud with the kids coming in. Video is on. That's okay. <laughs> That's part of our class, right? It happens. It gets loud in the hallway. So chapter 9, Miss LePage read the other day on Monday. Does anyone remember what happened in chapter 9? No, I wasn't here. Oh, that's right. You weren't here, Lucas. Uh, chapter 9, what happened? They were, Winnie was traveling with the Fosters, and they had been traveling for a long time. And they finally got to the Tuck's house, which was really buried in the woods. And Winnie just met, um, where are we here? Jake Angus. Angus. Sorry, I was trying to find his first name. Mr. Tuck. So Winnie just met Mr. Tuck, Angus Tuck, for the first time. That was, that was kind of the gist of it, I guess. They traveled a lot for a really long way. And she just met Angus Tuck. Well, then again, the strangers did everything. True. All right, so chapter 10. Winnie had grown up with order. She was used to it. Under the pit pitiless double assaults of her mother and grandmother, the cottage where she lived was always squeaking clean, mopped and swept and scoured into limp submission. There was no room for carelessness no putting things off until later. The foster women had made a fortress out of duty. Within it, they were indomitable, and Winnie was in training. So she was unprepared for the homely little house beside the pond, unprepared for the gentle eddies of dust, the silver cobwebs, the mouse who lived, and welcomed to him in a table drawer. There were only three rooms, the kitchen came first with an open cabinet where dishes were stacked in perilous towers without the least regard for their varying dimensions. There was an enormous black stove and a metal sink and every surface, every wall was piled and strewn and hung with everything imaginable from onions to lanterns to wooden spoons to wash tubs and in a corner stood Tuck's forgotten shotgun. What? Yep. The parlor came next where the furniture, loose and sloping with age, was set about helter-skelter. An ancient green plush sofa lolled alone in the center, like yet another mossy fallen log facing a soot-streaked soot fireplace, still deep in last winter's ashes. The table with the drawer that housed the mouse was pushed off, also alone, into a far corner, and three armchairs and an elderly rocker stood about aimlessly like strangers at a party ignoring each other. So, so far it's kind of said that Winnie has grown up used to having everything neat and in order and that that's kind of from this day and age, it was kind of like the woman's job to keep the house tidy and everything had a place <laughs> and keep it looking really clean. So she was not prepared for going in the Tuck's house, which sounds like it's got stuff Mm. Dishes piled, cobwebs in the corners, yeah. old furniture everywhere, mm -hmm. and a mouse living in a drawer. And I spied it. Yeah. Gross. <clears throat> Beyond this was the bedroom, where a vast and tipsy brass bed took up most of the space. But there was room beside it for the washstand with the lonely mirror. And opposite its foot, a ca cavernous oak wardrobe from which leaked the faint smell of camphor. Up a steep flight of narrow stairs was a dusty loft. That's where the boys sleep when they're home, May explained. And that was all. And yet it was not quite all, for there was everywhere evidence of their activities. Mays and tucks, her sewing, patches and scraps of bright cloth, half-completed quilts and braided rugs. A bag of cotton battling with wisps of its contents, like snow drifting into cracks and corners. The arms of the sofa webbed with strands of thread and dangerous with needles. His wood carving, curly shavings spurring the floor, and little heaps of splinters and chips. Every surface dim with the sawdust of countless sandings. Limbs of unassembled dolls and wooden soldiers. A ship model propped on the mouse's table, waiting for its glue to dry. And a stack of wooden bowls, their sides smooth to velvet. The topmost bowl filled with a jumble of big wooden spoons and forks like dry bleached bones. We make things to sell, said May, surveying the mess approvingly. 
And still this was not all, for on the old beam ceiling of the parlor, streaks of light swam and danced and wavered like a bright mirage, reflected through the windows from the sunlit surface of the pond. There were bowls of daisies everywhere, gay, white, and yellow, and over everything was the clean, sweet smell of the water and its weeds, the chatter of a swooping kingfisher, the carol and trill of a dozen other kinds of bird, and occasionally the thrilling bass note of an unastonished bullfrog at ease somewhere along the muddy banks. Mm. What's you? Muddy banks. Muddy banks? Muddy. Muddy. Muddy, muddy banks. Muddy. It's by the pond. Sometimes ponds are muddy. Into it all came Winnie, eyes wide and very much amazed. It was a whole new idea to her that people could live in such disarray. But at the same time, she was charmed. It was comfortable. Climbing behind May up the stairs to see the loft, she thought to herself, maybe it's because they think they have forever to clean it up. And this was followed by another thought, far more revolutionary. Maybe they just don't care. The boys don't be home very much, said May, as they came up into the half light of the loft. But when they are, they bed up here. There's plenty of room. The loft was cluttered too with all kinds of odds and ends, but there were two mattresses rolled out on the floor and fresh sheets and blankets were folded almost neatly on each, waiting to be spread. Where do they go when they're away? asked Winnie. What do they do? Oh, said May, they go different places, do different things. They work at what jobs they can get, try to bring home some of their money. Miles can do carpentry, or sorry, carp. <laughs> She says it in a different way. That's why I have to read it. What's Carpentering. It? And he's a pretty fair blacksmith too. Jesse, now, he don't ever seem too settled in himself. Of course, he, he's young. She stopped and smiled. That sounds funny, don't it? Still, it's true, just the same. So Jesse, he does what strikes him at the moment, working in the fields or in saloons, things like that, whatever he comes across but they can't stay on in any one place for long, you know? None of us can. People get to wondering, she sighed. We've been in this house about as long as we dare, going on 20 years. It's a right nice place. Tuck's got so he's real attached to it. Then too, it's off by itself. Plenty of fish in the pond, not too far from the towns around. When we need things, we go sometimes to one, sometimes the next, so people don't come to notice us much and we sell where we can, but I guess we'll be moving on one of these days. It's just about time. It sounded rather sad to Winnie, never to belong anywhere. That's too bad, she said, glancing shyly at May. Always moving around and never having any friends or anything? But May shrugged off this observation. Tuck and me, we got each other, she said, and that's a lot. The boys, now they go their separate ways. They're some different don't always get on too good, but they come home whenever the spirit moves and every 10 years, first week of August, they meet at that spring and come home together so we can be a family again for a little while. That's why we was there this morning. One way or another, it all works out. She folded her arms and nodded more to herself than to Winnie. Life's got to be lived no matter how long or short, she said calmly. You got to take what comes. We just go along like everybody else one day at a time. Funny, we don't feel no different. Leastways, I don't. Sometimes I forget about what's happened to us, forget it altogether. And then sometimes it comes over me and I wonder why it happened to us. We're plain assault, us tucks. We don't deserve no blessings, if it is a blessing. And likewise, I don't see how we deserve to be cursed if it is a curse. Still, there's no use trying to figure why things fall the way they do. Things just are and fussing don't bring changes. Tuck. Now he's got a few other ideas, but I expect he'll tell you. There, the boys are in from the pond when he heard a burst of voices downstairs and in a moment, Miles and Jesse were climbing to the loft. Here, child, said May hastily. Hide your eyes. Boys, are you decent? What'd you put on to swim in? I got Winnie up here. Do you hear me? For goodness sake, Ma, said Jesse, emerging from the stairwell. You think we're gonna march around and are all together with Winnie Foster in the house? <laughs> And Miles behind him said, we just jumped in with our clothes on, too hot and tired to shed them. It was true. 
They stood there side by side with their wet clothes plastered to their skins, like pool, or little pools of water collecting in their feet. Well, said May, relieved. All right, find something dry to put on. Your paws got supper nearly ready, and she hustled Winnie down the narrow stairs. That was chapter 11, or chapter 10.